Good afternoon. Uh, so uh, thanks all for coming. Uh, so uh, first let me start off by uh, just saying a word or two about why the title on the slide isn't the title that was distributed when this uh, talk was first announced. So um, my group has been involved for the last couple of years in uh, something I have been referring to as internet scale overlay hosting. Uh, and recently I've been uh, becoming interested in uh, this cloud computing model that's been evolving and it's uh, and I've been trying to understand the relationship between the overlay hosting uh, kind of uh, model we've been uh, pursuing and uh, the cloud computing. And it's becoming clear that uh, the cloud computing environment uh, offers a great context for the kind of advanced networking uh, capabilities that we've been developing. So while the, uh, uh, this isn't exactly the same talk I would have given a month ago when this uh, trip was planned, it does address a lot of the same core issues and I hope that by Putting this, it in this context, it'll make it uh, relate better to some of the things that are going on here. So let me just you know, start off with some uh, basic uh, introductions. Cloud computing is, uh, has emerged as a um, mechanism for supporting a variety of different uh, computing applications, but in particular uh, for uh, delivering web-based services and uh, the uh, uh, power of it uh, includes the ability to uh, rapidly deploy new services on a global scale, allowing even small organizations to uh, quickly uh, develop and deploy uh, new kinds of applications. And of course, the uh, dynamic scaling uh, offered by the cloud computing environment uh, enables the uh, uh, supporting mechanisms to uh, scale up and down in response to user demand. But the range of the applications that can be supported in typical cloud computing environments is uh, fairly constrained by uh, some of the limitations imposed uh, by the internet. The fundamental internet service model that at least that's available in the public internet has barely moved in about the last 20 years. Uh, so we're essentially using uh, the same internet services that we were uh, back in the 1980s. So what I'm going to be talking about is the introduction of a dynamic network layer uh, within the cloud computing infrastructure to extend the range of applications, in particular to support real applications that involve a significant real-time person-to-person uh, interaction uh, capability. And this um, uh, dynamic networking layer is completely programmable so that it can be adapted to the needs of particular applications. Uh, it's also uh, completely optional so that applications that are perfectly happy with the ordinary uh, networking capabilities offered by the internet uh, can simply use those directly uh, without any uh, cost uh, impact uh, by the, uh, uh, without having to bear any of the costs of the uh, dynamic uh, networking layer. Now, some of the things that are needed in order to support the introduction of dynamic uh, networking are listed here, and I'll get into uh, some uh, more details as we go along. Uh, so first of all, uh, the application developers will need the ability to specify where processing uh, resources are located uh, geographically. Uh, they'll need to be able to um, connect their clusters of processing resources with uh, provision virtual links, uh, have the mechanisms to support internet scale uh, traffic volumes while getting router-like performance, uh, and uh, the, one of the keys to enabling uh, that is the integration of uh, flexible high-performance packet processors into the uh, infrastructure in addition to the conventional kinds of servers that are uh, provided today. So here's just sort of a picture of uh, uh, the kind of cloud computing infrastructure we're talking about. So you have a collection of distributed data centers on top of which uh, we can layer uh, many, uh, a number of different applications. So I'm showing uh, just one uh, application here now connected by uh, provision virtual links. And at each uh, data center, we may in fact have a cluster of processing resources that uh, may be uh, specialized by function. So we may have a, some lower level processors that are implementing 
uh, the uh, core uh, network forwarding uh, and core services uh, that are provided to the upper layers, uh, a set of application processors uh, that implement the main application logic, and potentially some additional uh, processors and interface to uh, users. So before I get into some of the specifics, let me tell you a little bit about a very small application study that we've done to try to um, you know, investigate the kinds of capabilities that are uh, most suitable for this kind of uh, dynamic network infrastructure uh, and um, uh, help us kind of uh, uh, explore the limits of what we can do. Uh, so this is a, a scalable online uh, game uh, application. Uh, and of course, there are a variety of ways you can distribute the state associated with a large game. We've been focusing on um, highly interactive games like first-person shooters, uh, which leads you uh, typically to uh, distribute uh, applica the application in a particular way. So uh, the, the servers around the periphery here uh, serve the uh, uh, players or manage the avatars for the players that are physically connected to them so that we get uh, responsive, uh, rapid response to a uh, user input. Uh, and then uh, the uh, uh, overlay network that supports uh, the servers uh, provides uh, game aware uh, network services. And in particular, uh, we use omnidirectional uh, multicast to provide the state update distribution with uh, region-based filtering, that is regions in the virtual world. So state updates issued by the servers on behalf of their players uh, get distributed across the, uh, the multicast. And uh, at the uh, egress, uh, the servers uh, will uh, receive only updates for regions of the virtual world that they're subscribed to. And just some uh, quick back of the envelope uh, estimates to uh, sort of help calibrate you. If each dynamic object in the game generates, say, 20 to 30 kilobits per second of traffic, then a game with, say, 10K objects, which is roughly 10K players, uh, would uh, involve maybe two to 300 megabits per second of network capacity for all of the uh, traffic combined. You wouldn't necessarily have that on any single link. Um, and uh, so uh, even if you did, however, you could support, say, 30 game sessions of this size on a 10 gigabit link. So you know, while this is, um, you know, for a game this size, this is a non-trivial amount of uh, network capacity. It's not really at all uh, large by uh, modern standards. And of course, there is the potential to uh, reduce the, the bandwidth use substantially as you get close to the edge of the network, uh, although at the core you might uh, come close to those kinds of levels. One of the key issues with uh, these kinds of applications is managing the state uh, update uh, distribution. Uh, again, there are a variety of ways you can do this. We're not really particularly focused on you know, the, uh, getting the best possible way of uh, uh, managing the game, since the, the objective here is really to explore the networking, uh, the implications for the network layer. Uh, but let me just say a little bit about the, the general approach we're taking. Uh, so. Um, uh, we divide the, the game world into uh, static regions uh, and associate a multicast with each region. You can either do this using a rectangular distribution. Here I'm showing a, a hexagonal uh, division of the game world. And again, uh, uh, object updates would be labeled uh, with the region identifier uh, where the object is currently located. And each server will receive state updates for only those portions of the game world that are visible from where it is. Uh, to make this work efficiently, you need some uh, mechanism for uh, compactly uh, representing the regions that are visible from any point in the game world. And so I'm not going to go through this in any detail. But here is just sort of an indication of a, um, uh, well, in this diagram, the, the yellow uh, regions are those that are visible from the central point. The light and dark uh, blue regions are invisible. We can represent this by uh, encoding a tree. And so with a, a fairly compact uh, bit string, we can uh, encode the visibility region even for a fairly extensive uh, portion of the game world. Uh, okay. 
again, servers can subscribe to the regions as needed, or uh, you know, we can uh, also think about extending the underlying network service to actually um, infer those subscriptions simply by observing the traffic coming from the servers. If we you know, observe the state updates coming from uh, servers, we can implicitly uh, uh, determine what uh, other regions they should be interested in based on this uh, visibility information. Now, in either case, uh, as soon as a server is subscribed to a given region, it's going to start automatically receiving updates. Uh, there's no coordination that's necessarily required with the sender. Uh, but uh, one complicating factor is typically state updates and games are delta encoded. So you only transmit an update. You only transmit the parameters that change uh, as the uh, game uh, proceeds. Uh, with, uh, without having any explicit interaction with the sender, this creates an issue. We can resolve this in a couple of ways. One is simply to periodically send full state updates at some lower rate. Uh, another alternative is to uh, have the uh, uh, endpoints issue requests for full updates as they're needed, and those can either be delivered back to the sender uh, or potentially cached within the overlay uh, nodes themselves. Now, we built an initial prototype, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this to uh, uh, put some things in perspective. So this was implemented within uh, Washington University's Open Network Lab, which is built around uh, uh, network processor-based routers. So we have IXP 2800s that uh, are implementing the routing nodes. These are these ones that are shown in green here on the uh, user interface. Mm -hmm. And so for the particular uh, uh, application or the particular uh, configuration here, we have uh, eight routers and 20 servers. And for the, uh, the starting point for this study, we just did kind of the simplest thing you can uh, imagine. We represent the game world with a rectangular grid uh, representing the regions with all up state updates delivered by to all routers in the game. So we're not tra attempting to do any uh, traffic filtering in the uh, backbone of the network. We are filtering at the edges so that the servers only receive the updates they need, but we go ahead and distribute the updates uh, throughout to all of the routers. And to support this, uh, we add two uh, plugins to the, uh, to the routers. Uh, a subscription plugin, which just handles the subscription requests coming from the, uh, the servers. Uh, and uh, the subscription information is uh, very simple. It's simply an a, uh, array of bit vectors that uh, identifies the ports that are associated, that packets should be forwarded on for each um, uh, region of the game world. And then a multicast forwarding uh, uh, plugin that runs on four of the micro engines of the, uh, the IXP2800. Uh, so here's just a little bit about the, uh, the software that's mapped onto the IXP2800. Uh, for those who aren't aware of this, the 2800 is a uh, multi-core processor with uh, 32 uh, RISC uh, processor cores. Uh, in the uh, Intel uh, context, these are referred to as micro engines. Uh, and uh, what this is showing is the, the main uh, packet processing uh, pipeline and the mapping of that pipeline onto microengines. So that's what the uh, parenthetical comments are referring to. Uh, so the, the two major components here are these two in the center, the, the pars lookup and copy block, which uh, parses the packet header, uh, performs uh, both route lookups and general packet classification using the, the TCAM and uh, the copying required for multicast. There's a queue manager that manages uh, uh, about 16,000 queues for each of the uh, outgoing ports. Uh, and then uh, there are also uh, connections to the uh, X-scale management processor that uh, controls the operation of the system as a whole. Now, in addition, in the ONL router, we've uh, added a plug-in environment. We basically set aside five of the uh, micro engines to implement uh, plugins that can be uh, added by uh, users. And uh, so each plugin has, its, has a dedicated uh, uh, queue of packets uh, being directed to it, but uh, we can also share these queues in various ways. Uh, and there are a couple of micro engines that just implement general bookkeeping functions. The uh, subscription plugin runs on uh, the first uh, uh, micro engine, 
Uh, and then we have four microengines that are implementing the multicast forwarding, actually replicating the multicast packets as state updates are received. And these uh, operate off of a single uh, shared queue. Uh, and uh, uh, after packets have been copied, they're uh, forwarded by the plugins uh, to the queue manager. And the, the forwarding table is kept in external SRAM accessible to uh, all of the plugins. Uh, and so uh, changes made by the uh, subscription plugin are immediately uh, available to the multicast forwarders. So just uh, a couple of results, uh, some performance results uh, associated with this. Uh, so there are two metrics I'll mention. The first is uh, FANN. Uh, FANN is the number of objects for which uh, a server receives updates. Now, if the, uh, if the game world is divided up too coarsely, we'll end up receiving state updates for um, objects we don't really care about. They may be in regions where we potentially have some interest, but we may not be able to actually see those objects uh, in the uh, game world because the region is so big. Uh, and so uh, we'd like to uh, keep the fan in as small as possible because that's a, a significant, that has a significant impact on the performance that the servers can sustain. Uh, the second parameter I'll mention is the regions of interest. This is the number of regions that servers must subscribe to. Uh, we'd like to keep this small in order to reduce the subscription overhead. And of course, the easiest way to keep that small is to have large regions. So these two things trade off against one another. And you can see that uh, in this chart. So what this is showing, this is a fairly small instance of the game. We have three players on each of 20 servers, so a total of 60 uh, players in all. And uh, as we uh, divide the game world up into smaller and smaller regions, the uh, fan in uh, drops uh, from a high of around 50 here for the maximum fan in down to a little under 30. Uh, and similarly for the average fan in, we go from about half that. Um, and this uh, uh, asymptote represents the, the fan in that corresponds to the number of objects that players are actually interested in receiving the updates for. So dividing the game world any finer at that point doesn't really do you any good. Uh, and of course, we can see that the number of regions of interest is growing roughly linearly with the uh, number of regions in the uh, game world, as you would expect. Uh, and so the uh, kind of sweet spot uh, happens to be at this uh, place where the uh, number of regions matches, uh, roughly matches the number of players. Uh, and uh, this is characteristic of maps that have relatively uniform uh, spaces in the virtual world, as you have maps where the, the spaces in the virtual world vary widely in size, they'll, this, this uh, characteristic will be more uh, complicated than what you're seeing here. And this kind of simple uniform division into a, a uniform grid is going to be uh, less suitable as well. Uh, this slide is showing, or this chart is showing um, how the uh, uh, fan in and regions of interest uh, scale as you increase the number of players on a server. Uh, and um, uh, so this is with a, a fixed map with a fixed number of regions. And so uh, uh, bo both uh, kinds of parameters are increasing with the number of players per server. Something that's important to keep in mind, though, uh, if you think about scaling in a larger scale, is that as we increase the number of players, what we're doing here is we're fixing the number of um, this isn't just increasing the number of players per server. It's also increasing the total number of players in the game. Uh, and that's really a, a large part of why uh, the scaling is occurring the way it is. Uh, and uh, one of the things that's uh, important in these virtual environments is as you increase the scale of the, or as you increase the number of players, you also typically want to increase the scale of the game world as well. If things get too crowded, games become difficult to play, uh, and you know, people die out too quickly. And, uh, so you typically uh, scale these things together rather than independently, as indicated here. OK. One of the reasons we're uh, interested in this, in addition to uh, just uh, using it as a vehicle to kind of uh, explore uh, these, how these kinds of overlay techniques can be uh, implemented, is that we're interested in the potential of these kinds of virtual collaboration environments for um, uh, having an impact on uh, things like 
um, large-scale travel. So some of you are probably familiar with SUN's MPK20 project. Uh, there's the potential with applications like this to significantly uh, impact the amount of travel. And as we all become uh, much more aware of the environmental impact associated uh, with both physical travel and the infrastructure needed to support uh, physical travel, uh, finding smarter ways to deal with that uh, is becoming more and more important. Uh, we simply can't afford to have you know, everybody in India and China um, you know, having the same kind of energy and environmental impact that everyone in the U.S. sort of takes for granted. Uh, that simply doesn't appear to be sustainable in the long term. Uh, and so uh, using uh, uh, these kinds of advanced applications to uh, uh, address that kind of issue can have a big impact. Now, there's some interesting problems if you really want to try to make virtual environments like this uh, work well. And one of the most important is actually uh, not video, but audio. Uh, so high quality, environmentally accurate audio uh, can have a tremendous impact on the perceived quality of the uh, virtual environment. So imagine a virtual environment that is being used to support a large scale conference where you can walk around the lobby of a conference center and uh, you know, uh, meet and talk to your friends and at the same time hear the six other conversations going on around you. Uh, and as you move through the virtual space, that has to uh, all happen in a natural way, even though the actual physical people may be at you know, hundreds of different locations around the world. And in order to make that happen, you need to bring together uh, the appropriate subset of those uh, audio inputs and bridge them uh, for every single participant in the, um, in the conference. Uh, so that creates some uh, interesting uh, challenges for at both the application level and potentially at the network level, because some of this uh, may uh, get pushed down to the network level in order to handle it uh, most efficiently. Uh, we'd also like to be able to do things like use video to capture um, the expression of the uh, individual and perhaps use that to control the expression on the uh, user's avatar, uh, control where they're looking and uh, how they're moving. And uh, of course, at the network level, we need to provide the network level support to ensure consistent performance, even as uh, people move around the game world or the virtual environment uh, and uh, interact with uh, changing numbers of uh, other people. All right, well, let me get back to the uh, way we might uh, implement these kinds of applications in a um, uh, cloud computing uh, environment. So this is just showing uh, some of the components of an application cluster that might support this kind of application in a uh, uh, large implementation. Uh, and so we're dividing the, we have uh, multiple kinds of processing uh, elements that serve different roles in the application. So at the front end, we may have some uh, access nodes and interface uh, to users and provide load balancing across uh, application servers. The application servers might implement the core application logic. So things like uh, the game physics computations and issuing state updates uh, uh, to the uh, network and uh, the backbone uh, nodes that uh, provide the core data path services like the multicast forwarding and subscription. And over at the right here, uh, an application controller to uh, oversee the overall operation of the application, coordinated over multiple sites in combination with uh, the application controllers running in other sites. So we'll do things like manage session creation, uh, uh, create uh, incrementally uh, create multicast trees and so forth. Okay. Now to um, uh, implement this kind of application most effectively, uh, it's uh, going to be helpful to have uh, processing components that are well suited to different tasks. Now conventional servers are well suited to implement uh, the kind of sophisticated application logic uh, that we uh, have in uh, an application like the, uh, the distributed gaming or virtual environments uh, application. Uh, for some of the lower level uh, processing, things like network processor blades uh, that are designed for real-time packet processing can provide uh, significantly better performance. 
uh, we've you know, doing sort of side by side comparisons of uh, network processor packet processing versus uh, uh, packet processing and user space on conventional server blades. We see you know m well over an order of magnitude improvement in throughput and multiple orders of magnitude uh, improvement in latency, uh, and those uh, you know. Throughput and latency uh, characteristics are uh, extremely important for applications that are uh, highly interactive and involve you know, direct person-to-person -person, uh, communication. Now, it's not just network processor blades. It may be other types of processing subsystems as well that can play a role here, uh, FPGAs and DSPs for uh, audio and video processing, and potentially even uh, graphics processing units. Even though the GPUs are typically, uh, we think of that as uh, something that happens only in the end device, they can also potentially play a role uh, in certain applications in the uh, infrastructure. Now, having this kind of diverse collection of processing resources uh, available within the cloud computing uh, infrastructure is reasonably straightforward to support if you have a um, uh, resource model where your, your basic, uh, what you think of as your basic API uh, uh, focuses on allocating raw resources to applications. Uh, the, you know, the glue that holds things together is nothing more than the commodity uh, 10 gigabit ethernet uh, switching layer that's now uh, coming into uh, existence. Uh, and I want to point out that there's, um, uh, one can, uh, even in the context of this kind of lower level raw resource provisioning model, implement higher level APIs on top of that. Uh, the only question is, you know, what level of visibility do you provide to that lower level? Do you have one API or multiple APIs? Uh, and certainly uh, uh, there's a variety of, uh, you know, there's a large space of possibilities there. Okay. So one of the crucial things that's necessary to enable applications like this to work well within a cloud computing uh, infrastructure is the provision of application isolation. So you want to isolate one application from another, first of all, so that they can't interfere with the correct operation of other applications, but also so that they can't interfere with the performance that other applications uh, experience. Now, certainly the easiest way to achieve application isolation is physical separation. And in fact, for applications that are large enough scale to justify at least one processing element in every physical location, uh, physical separation is a great alternative, okay? So it can work well for a large fraction of the kinds of applications that you typically want to run in a uh, cloud computing environment. Uh, so as long as each processing component is used by one application, we can physically uh, separate the applications fairly easily. Uh, at the network level, we can use uh, VLANs to uh, isolate the packet traffic from one another. That is, so one application can't send packets into another uh, application's virtual network. Uh, and as long as we have a non-blocking switching layer, we effectively get traffic isolation. Okay, that's you know, essentially what non-blocking switching means. If, on the other hand, we want to uh, share processing components, uh, there are uh, some various ways we can do this, and there are certainly times when sharing processing components is useful. Uh, if we're using conventional servers, then virtual machines gives us an effective way of at least getting the security kind of isolation that we want. Uh, there are limited uh, abilities to provide performance isolation within perf virtual machines. Uh, for NPs, we've uh, actually put together uh, a configurable runtime framework where we have programmable plugins at various points in the uh, processing pipeline and have been able to demonstrate that you can you know, get a reasonable level of flexibility uh, using these kinds of limited uh, mechanisms. Now this does uh, sharply constrain the programming environment, uh, making this most suitable for basically simple fast path processing that you map onto a shared network processor rather than more complex processing. It's also uh, important to recognize that if you're going to share processing components, there, there are implications for the underlying network. Uh, you need finer grain network queuing if you're going to maintain isolation between you know, different 
uh, components that are uh, reached through a single uh, network interface, for example, okay, coming out of a switch. Uh, and so having per VLAN queues with configurable bandwidth becomes uh, a required uh, capability. So uh, this, all of these issues have some implications for how data center switching is carried out in this uh, environment. So let me say a little bit about that. Uh, so here's sort of a you know, cartoon of a, a folded Benish network or fat tree uh, topology, which is uh, typical of uh, the uh, topologies that are used for uh, enabling scaling uh, across a wide range of sizes. So this kind of uh, architecture using uh, commodity switching components enables you to build data centers supporting uh, thousands to tens of thousands uh, of servers and uh, uh, allows you to take advantage of the uh, commodity switch components that are available now. Now, in order to get isolation of application clusters, again, we can restrict the routing between different application clusters simply by using uh, virtual LAN uh, techniques that are supported by uh, the commodity uh, switch components. Uh, and uh, we need non-blocking switching over those uh, uh, switches in order to uh, uh, get the um, uh, traffic isolation, even if we're physically separating uh, the uh, applications on uh, different processing elements. Now, ideally, uh, this is done with per-destination queues. Uh, and by per-destination here, I actually mean you know, per endpoint over this whole collection. So if you've got a data center with 100,000 uh, processing elements, or you, if you really want isolation over that entire complex, you need 100,000 queues on each link. Okay? Now that's obviously not something you're going to see in commodity switching platforms, but that is the kind of characteristic that it takes to guarantee non-blocking switching. So what else can you do? So if you want to uh, get the effect of non-blocking switching and uh, other things as well, you need to add some additional capabilities around the edges of this network. And so let me mention uh, three in uh, particular. So first of all, uh, load balancing. This kind of a uh, interconnection topology creates lots of different paths between uh, any point in the network. Uh, and in order to um, uh, get non-blocking performance, you're going to have to take advantage of those um, different paths that are available to you. You can either do that by uh, load balancing on flows or aggregates of flows, or you can do it by load balancing on packets, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Another issue is how to uh, regulate the traffic flows within an application cluster so as to avoid uh, causing congestion within the uh, uh, switching network. And finally, uh, for applications that require multicast, we need some mechanism to support uh, multicast forwarding uh, within the clusters. And uh, throughout, we need to uh, ensure that processing elements can only be used in a, straightforward, uh, in a safe way. Uh, with conventional server blades, if we have control of the operating system, it's fairly easy to uh, ensure this. With some of these lower level components, like network processors that typically don't have a an operating system per se. Uh, in order to ensure safe use, you need to be more reliant on uh, mechanisms that are available at the switch layer. OK, so let's uh, talk briefly about this uh, load balancing issue. So again, here's kind of the, the cartoon uh, of the, uh, the network topology. And in order to uh, get uh, effective non-blocking performance across an entire data center, we need to distribute the load uh, coming from the processing elements down here at the bottom uh, across all of the uh, top-level switches. So the, one of the uh, conceptually most straightforward things to do is to distribute the, the uh, traffic based on flows or some aggregate of flows. And uh, one of the things that makes this attractive is that it gives you a very direct way of maintaining packet order for packets that belong uh, to a single end-to-end -end flow. But it leads to significantly less than optimal uh, balancing of the load uh, across these switches. 
And so uh, an obvious question is, how bad does it get? Well, if you want to do load balancing on an incremental basis, that is, you know, as a new flow starts, you want to pick a top-level switch through which to route that flow in order to reach your destination, then if you have a topology that requires this kind of a three-level network, you actually need a six times over-provisioning the switch bandwidth in order to guarantee that you can always accommodate that next new flow. Okay. Now, you can reduce that to about 2x if you allow yourself to dynamically rearrange flows. But rearrangement is, uh, can be costly. You can't count on being able to just rearrange a few flows. You may, in fact, uh, need to rearrange a very large fraction of flows in order to accommodate a new one. And of course, it can be disruptive because when you rearrange flows, you're sending packets along different paths, which means you no longer are maintaining the packet ordering, which was the reason for using flow-based load balancing in the first place. No, no, it actually has very little to do with the buffer size. It really, um, uh, let me take that offline because it's 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 not a short explanation. Okay, the you get this six up even if it was circuit switching. Even if you were doing circuit switching, you'd still have that 6x speed up requirement. And the, um, and the last point here is, you know, the, the truth is flows aren't static, right? Flows don't have a single bandwidth. They're constantly changing their uh, bandwidth usage. Uh, and if you're um, going to, uh, you know, keep the load balanced well, you're going to need to frequently rearrange as the uh, traffic changes. So all of that is a little problematical. So that leads us to the alternative of doing packet level load balancing. And in contrast, packet level load balancing is capable of providing ideal load balancing all across all of the top level switches. And it's robust to changes in the uh, dynamic traffic. Uh, but it does require resequencing at the output. Okay, that is, you need to maintain at the, uh, at, at the egress, uh, you need to maintain resequencing buffers that can take the packets uh, and deliver them uh, in the order that they entered the network rather than the order that they came out. However, in the context of a network where you have well-regulated traffic flows, it's actually fairly easy and inexpensive to implement this kind of packet level resequencing. Uh, and so uh, I would argue that, in fact, uh, this is a, a more straightforward um, problem to solve, and it completely avoids the, the speed-up requirements that are associated with doing flow-based uh, or aggregate load balancing. Now let me say a little bit about this uh, traffic regulation problem. Uh, Non-blocking switches, in general, are, in order to uh, deliver non-blocking uh, performance, they require admissible traffic. So in particular, that means that you can't send more traffic to an output than it's capable of receiving. Uh, so processing elements down here you know, have a limited bandwidth at this interface. And if you have you know, 100 processing elements that are all trying to send traffic simultaneously to this guy, you, can, you have the potential for congestion here, which can leak over into uh, other um, uh, portions of the network and interfere with traffic going to other outputs that may not be congested. Okay. So we want to avoid congesting those uh, outgoing interfaces to P's in order to uh, enable us to get non-blocking uh, behavior. So the key to doing this is to equip the processing elements with virtual output queues uh, that have configurable forwarding rates. And then adjusting those forwarding rates dynamically using a control algorithm that's periodically distributing information about uh, the backlogs that different processing elements have for various destinations and uh, dynamically adjust the queue rates uh, to, in the first place, uh, ensure that we don't get congestion at any of the outputs. Uh, and secondly, while attempting to optimize whatever our performance objective is. It may be simply throughput or it may be some more uh, complex um, uh, objective. Now, it is possible uh, with this kind of an approach uh, uh, to get strong performance guarantees. If you have some uh, 2x uh, speed up uh, in the bandwidth, you can actually get fairly 
uh, uh, good performance even in the absence of significant speed up, uh, although to get you know, theoretically provable performance guarantees, you do need that uh, 2x speed up. And uh, in, when this kind of technique is applied in routers, we'll typically have a virtual output queue for every destination in the system. In a data center with 100,000 uh, destinations, uh, the uh, uh, maintenance of 100,000 uh, VOQs and the distribution of backlog for 100,000 VOQs becomes problematical. And so for scalability reasons, we may want to limit the number of concurrently active VOQs at the application level. That is, you constrain the number of destinations that each processing engine is going to talk to at any one time uh, so as to uh, be able to limit the number of um, uh, VOQs for which you have to maintain state. Okay, multicast is another uh, crucial feature for uh, a number of applications. Uh, Ethernet-based multicast turns out to be of fairly limited use uh, in this context uh, because it relies on broadcast within VLAN domains. Now, you could conceivably use VLANs on a per multicast session basis, that is basically set up a VLAN so that you deliver the packets only exactly where you want them to go. Uh, but that uh, 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 is a fairly limited approach uh, and, uh, well, it's limited by the number of VLANs you have at your disposal and by the overhead required for uh, configuring VLANs. Uh, there's also no straightforward way to regulate the traffic in this context. And so an alternative uh, which uh, works quite well in this uh, situation is to push the handling of multicasts back to the processing engines and use a, a distributed multi-pass uh, kind of mechanism where packets are copied by the processing uh, elements into VOQs, and then normal VOQ scheduling and unicast switching mechanisms can be used to deliver them to the destination. Okay? Uh, and uh, to get the most scalable um, uh, multicast delivery, we can do this with a simple uh, binary multicast tree. So this is being illustrated here. Think of uh, this circle as denoting a processing element where uh, the multicast is originating and uh, where we send a two dest this uh, processing element forwards the packet to two destinations by placing copies in two different VOQs. This relay uh, processing engine forwards them to two more uh, similarly here. And so we have four copies being made, having made what one, two, three passes uh, through the uh, network. In general, if we want to produce a, a fan-out F multicast, uh, we're going to end up sending a total of roughly two F packets uh, across the switch. So this does imply that multicast has basically a 2x bandwidth penalty relative to unicast. Uh, but it gives you a, a simple and highly scalable uh, way to implement multicast and kind of pushes it into the application space uh, rather than uh, pushing it onto the common switching infrastructure. Okay, so these edge functions I've been referring to can either be implemented in uh, processing elements uh, or in uh, some kind of fabric interface component. Uh, the load balancing and traffic regulation is a fairly simple thing to do. The processing associated with it is very simple. The amount of memory needed, even for the resequencing buffers, is fairly modest. Uh, on the other hand, this has uh, important implications for the security of different applications and in particular for the traffic isolation. Uh, and so this is a good choice to implement in a fabric interface component that's under the direct control of the, um, the cloud computing uh, infrastructure. Uh, multicast, on the other hand, is a, an is a, a network feature that's highly application dependent. In fact, exactly what we mean by multicast may change significantly from one application to another. Uh, if we uh, implement multicast using this kind of distributed multipass approach, there's really no security impact because all of the traffic isolation uh, and so forth is handled by uh, forwarding, we're really forwarding just unicast packets uh, in the core. It also, if we did attempt to uh, push it down into a, an interface component, uh, this does require uh, potentially large amounts of per flow state and buffering, so that can be expensive to push onto the common infrastructure. And so this is something that's best implemented by PEs and on a per application basis. Okay, 
So uh, let me quickly tell you a little bit about a prototype uh, platform we've put together uh, over the last uh, year or so uh, for you know, these kinds of uh, uh, applications. And this is really focused more on the, the overlay hosting environment. We've been working. We're you know, uh, rethinking this now in the cloud computing context. But I will, I'll just describe this uh, system um, as is now. Now, we targeted this for application in Planet Lab. So this is a fairly small scale system. Our objectives include uh, maintaining capability for standard Planet Lab applications. So somebody who has developed an application on Planet Lab can map it to our platform uh, without any changes and have things just work. This gives us an easy migration path. Uh, but also opens the door to boosting application performance by then restructuring the application to uh, map the uh, high frequency parts of the application onto a, a network processor resident fast path. So this enables uh, a small number of uh, NP blades to be shared by multiple uh, fast paths, which in the context of uh, Planet Lab, where we're talking about relatively uh, small amounts of uh, overall network bandwidth, uh, is uh, appropriate. Uh, we do this by having this configurable uh, framework with um, uh, plugins at particular points in the processing pipeline. Uh, and each fast path selects from uh, one of several uh, static code options that are available in the, uh, uh, as plugins. Uh, and we're planning to deploy five of these systems as part of the uh, Genie prototyping uh, initiative that's uh, just getting underway now. So let me uh, give, you, give a quick review about Planet Lab uh, in case anybody uh, isn't familiar with it. Uh, Connect, Planet Lab is kind of the canonical overlay hosting service, so it enables multiple overlays to run on top of a shared infrastructure. Uh, in Planet Lab, applications just run as user space processes within virtual machines. And it's been a uh, very effective and important research test bed, but it's had limited impact as a service deployment mechanism because it simply doesn't have the, the kinds of resources and kind of performance that's necessary to provide uh, effective um, application performance. And that's probably one of the largest installations in the world, then. <laughs> Typical installation is two. Uh, and uh, uh, local, uh, the, the local administrators get to determine how much network bandwidth the Planet Lab nodes get to use. And I was stunned to learn that it is not uncommon for network administrators to limit that to 100 kilobits per second. <laughs> and it's very common to limit it to maybe 10 megabits per second. Uh, so that kind of gives you a calibration point for, for typical applications. So what we've, been, uh, what we've done here is we've built a platform that uh, includes uh, network processor-based components and conventional server blades. Uh, and so uh, you can uh, run an application or run a portion of your application as a fa in a fast path that runs on the network processor blade while the... Um, uh, a portion uh, running on a general purpose server environment implements uh, exception handling and um, uh, control. So the expectation is that the, the majority of packets coming into the system will be uh, processed within the uh, network processor and forwarded on their way. Uh, but uh, occasionally, packets will be forwarded up to uh, the uh, uh, virtual machine for you know, more complex exception handling or, uh, or control operations. And of course, you can have multiple uh, slices sharing a network processor. And you can have applications that simply run in the standard, uh, as standard Planet Lab apps. Uh, the components of the system include a line card. This is also a network processor-based line card with 10 1 gig interfaces. Uh, we have the, uh, what we refer to as GPEs, general purpose processing engines. These are just conventional server blades that run the standard Planet Lab environments with a couple of small extensions. Uh, the uh, network processing engines are uh, dual IXP 2850s. 
Uh, there's a control processor which manages the operation of the system and implements the standard uh, Planet Lab control mechanisms. So in particular, it uh, interacts with the uh, PLC in Princeton to pull down new slice definitions. And based on those slice definitions, it'll go ahead and instantiate new uh, V servers running on one or more of the GPEs. And uh, finally, the line card provides all of the uh, uh, external I.O. Uh, and has a uh, queuing subsystem and filtering mechanisms uh, to uh, uh, deliver uh, arriving packets to the appropriate uh, either NPE or GPE. Uh, and so this is uh, uh, physically what the system looks like. So this is a six-slot uh, ATCA chassis with uh, three of, or I'm sorry, three of the network processor blades, uh, two uh, GPEs, and then the uh, switch blade down here at the bottom. What is the GPE for? The GPE just it, it is um, one of two different kinds of processing components. So you know, application developers can choose to run their application either entirely on a, on a conventional server blade or can use a combination of a server blade and the network processor blade, okay? So just as a, uh, to uh, get a, a quick characterization of how the performance of these two uh, varies, this is showing uh, the throughput of the uh, network processor up here for packets of varying sizes uh, and the uh, performance of the uh, network server or the uh, conventional server blade. These are uh, log scales on both axes. And so the network processor is uh, keeping up with the line rates for most uh, payload lengths for zero byte payloads. It's uh, falling a little short, but uh, is still getting close to uh, four gigabits per second. This is with actually just one of the uh, IXP 2850s on the uh, blade. Uh, the uh, conventional uh, server blade, on the other hand, uh, doing packet forwarding in the in user space, is barely able to keep up with uh, 50 kilobits per second, uh, and so we have about an 80x uh, improvement in uh, packet forwarding rate uh, in that case. Now, uh, at the high end of the uh, spectrum, we're still seeing a 10x improvement even for uh, maximum size packets. So just to sort of drive this point home, what this is saying is one of these is doing the work of 80 of these, okay, in this kind of context. So you know, if you're doing something that is low-level packet processing, uh, you're a whole lot better off, you know, pushing that down onto a lower-level mechanism like a network processor than attempting to handle it, uh, certainly as a user space program. Uh, and even in price performance terms, we see about a 15x uh, gain here. These network processors uh, don't come as cheap as these guys do either, uh, but uh, even taking the uh, added cost into account, you still get a substantial uh, gain. Okay, so let me uh, wrap up. Uh, so uh, our objective here with this dynamic networking is to enable uh, rapid deployment of new network services within a cloud computing infrastructure so that you can really create the services that you want to support your application rather than settling for the services that are provided by the internet as it exists today. So we can uh, remove the constraints that are imposed by the internet and extend the range of applications that we can handle. And in particular, uh, applications that require uh, a significant uh, real-time person-to-person kind of interaction component since that's the those are the applications that most uh, stress the limitations of the internet today. The technology needed to build uh, effective internet scale systems is on hand. We simply need to uh, put them together in the appropriate ways. Uh, the commodity 10 gigabit ethernet switches really are the uh, essential glue that uh, allows all of these different components uh, to work together effectively. Uh, it does take some, you know, small amount of additional edge functions in order to get effective non-blocking non switch performance and get the kind of application isolation that's needed. Uh, but, you know, this really doesn't take uh, very much. Uh, we think that having a, a model in which diverse processing components can be made available and uh, drawn on by application uh, developers is 
uh, helpful to uh, get the best price performance kinds of characteristics. And finally, uh, you know, there are lots of you know, good problems that need to be addressed in this context. I think the greatest opportunities really uh, rest in you know, developing new kinds of services, both at the network level and applications that can exploit new kinds of network services to uh, good effect. Uh, and so this is where I think the, the most exciting opportunities uh, exist as we uh, get these kinds of capabilities available within uh, uh, cloud infrastructures. Uh, there are also some you know, issues associated with how you build the cloud infrastructures. Of course, I've touched on a few. One that I haven't touched on at all is the control problem. How do you configure and manage this kind of a large distributed infrastructure? How does the, the cloud infrastructure interact with the users of the cloud infrastructure that want to you know, create and dynamically uh, modify their uh, computing infrastructure, supporting their application as it's running? Uh, and finally, you know, at the lower level, how do we make uh, better use of the, the kinds of uh, highly parallel processors and uh, uh, configurable hardware components that are now available to us uh, in the most effective way in these kinds of environments. And we have the ability to you know, really change the, the core, um, you know, what we used to think of as just the network hardware you know, at way, in ways we never could do you know, 10 years ago. Okay? Uh, and now, you know, everything at this level, you know, even at the very you know, um, high performance end of the spectrum, uh, is open to modification if we can you know, simply you know, decide what it is we want to do with it and how we can best uh, put it to use. So with that, I'll wrap up, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. Uh -huh. mind, you know, uh, there are many you know, objects spatially like uh, located perhaps and and they're wanting to like talk to each other. Uh -huh. So the like traffic distribution between them, you know, how does that you know, impact the the underlying networking uh, layer and its you know, algorithms over there? I mean, have you have you like looked into that particular well, are, are you asking specifically about this uh, distributed gaming uh, kind of application, or is that a decent example for this question? Or, or do you have something else in mind? Yeah, uh, I say if like, traffic is very uh, uh, bursty in uh, yep. nature uh, between the you know, objects of this you know, like distributed application, so they you know, like speed up to 10 gig, you know, and it's sure. only one minute, and then they are very... Uh, uh, right. Silent, you know, how do you, I mean, sure. is that a, uh, a uh, fair representation of the uh, Well, scenario? yeah, so, so, well, let me, you know, maybe put this in the context of the, the gaming application for a minute. Um, so in, in some respects, the gaming application is um, uh, less variable than what you're describing. Uh, because each of the uh, objects that make up the game are issuing state updates on a regular basis, say maybe 20 times a second, right? And they're, you know, fairly predictable size, so there's not a lot of um, uh, traffic variation. On the other hand, um, what happens at any given server may change as its players move around in the virtual environment. So as its players move around, they may that server may need to start subscribing to regions of the game world that it wasn't subscribing to before and may receive different amounts of uh, traffic going to it. Now, in fact, it's partly for that reason that our an initial version of this, we haven't even tried to optimize the use of the network bandwidth. We're simply uh, transmitting all state updates to all of the routers all the way around the edge. And that means that no matter how things move, we always have the state updates we need at each router, and so we can deliver them to the server. Okay, uh, and so you know we don't need to, you know, um, be very clever about how we uh, predict the use of network bandwidth. Uh, but certainly, if we were, you know, trying to optimize, in particular, those downstream feeds, so that we, you know, say pruned the multicast tree further up with respect to, you know, certain of those state updates, uh, 
then we would have an issue because if you, you know, if you do that pruning, then at the point where you need that network bandwidth, you want to be able to get it back. And if you if you haven't you know, essentially pre-reserved it, you're not gonna you can't count on getting it back. And there isn't really you know any there, there's no magic bullet there, right? If you want firm guarantees, okay, so that you can provide kind of strong quality of service, then there isn't really an alternative to reserving the capacity you want. So, yeah, so you know, um, if you had a very good projective uh, uh -huh. model of application sure. bandwidth, which, which is required, say, you know, yep. I know that in the like, next hour, you know, I would need this, uh, you know, like sure. 10 gig of uh, pi between like point A and point B. So in uh, those kind of uh, scenarios, uh, how would the you know the cloud computing algorithms for like distributing like network resources change? Would they would they kind of significantly change, or would they? I mean, is it is it? Uh, so I guess my fundamental yep. question is 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 your algorithm like very much uh, dependent on your you know, application like traffic, or is it sort of? So I don't want to give the impression that we have a solution to this problem. We don't. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, I, so um, as soon as you said your algorithm, I <laughs> inferred you were uh, uh, thinking we had this problem solved. We don't, okay? Um, and, and clearly it's an important issue, right? Uh, and you know, there's a, there's a clear trade-off. I mean, even, even in this gaming environment, I mean, the other thing that's going to clearly affect the amount of bandwidth you need is simply how many players there are in the game session, right? You know, a session with 10 players is going to be very different from a session with 1,000 players, right? Uh, and so, you know, the first thing you want to be able to predict is the trajectory of the number of players you're going to have. Uh, and, you know, I'm not sure how you would go about doing that, right? Okay. All right, thanks. Yep. Thanks. And it's going, to, it's going to change from application to application. So we had a question earlier about the where does the 6x speed up come from? Okay. Yeah. So um, so if you just had a, a two-level network, this becomes you know, what's uh, known uh, sort of in the classical literature as a close network. And there's a classical we circuit. Love, we love them, by the way. Okay. Good. So I'm, I'm glad that's not an unfamiliar term to at least some of you. Now, uh, three-stage closed networks have this you know, well-known property. If you want to make it non-blocking, your middle stage has to be twice as big as the edges, the, the first and third stage, right? And it's exactly the same fundamental property that's going on here. But when you take your three-stage closed network and go to five stages, right, that you know, uh, 2x speed up increases to a 3x, or I'm sorry, a 4x speed up. And when you go from five stages to seven stages, it goes from you know, 4x to 6x. Okay? And you know, this goes all the way back to 1953 and sort of the basic circuit switching uh, characteristics of these, these networks. And um, you know, this network we're seeing here is essentially a close network that's been folded back over on itself. Okay? So you know, in terms of its blocking characteristics, it behaves exactly the same way. Uh, and so that's where it comes from, but you know, that, that's the briefest answer I can give. I can certainly go into more details. There are more complications that arise as well because of the, the variable size of different flows, okay? And I'm largely ignoring that. I'm just sort of pretending all flows are actually the same size. And if you, when you actually take into account variable size flows, it can actually get worse than that 6x. So uh, my question was regarding the fan-in problem. You mentioned that to prevent fan-in from causing uh, queues uh, build-upping and propagating backwards, uh, there okay. is an algorithm or a distributed state mechanism that yep. monitors it. Have you guys implemented that? What does it look like? Yes. And what is the communication paradigm for communicate back to the source, to right. do essentially a source quench across the network? Yeah, so so we've implemented it, you know, in a slightly different context, but it's you know exactly the same uh, uh, algorithm that's required, uh, and so you know this involves you know periodically uh, sending backlog information, and in our case, 
uh, we simply uh, take that distributed backlog information and we use it to divide up the bandwidth in proportion to the different backlogs. So the simplest kind of throughput oriented metric you can use. Uh, for example, if you've got one input that's responsible for 50% of the backlog of packets going to a particular destination, well, you give it 50% of the bandwidth that's available at that interface, okay? So that's kind of just a very simple throughput optimizing um, uh, kind of mechanism you can use. Now, given those application, those allocations, then each input is going to, you know, attempt to send as much traffic as it can to each of the outputs up to the limit it's been given. Of course, it's also got to respect the, the bandwidth limitations of its ingress interface right. to the network, and that can potentially limit it as well. And it's because of the combination of that output limit and those ingress limitations that you actually need this 2x speed up if you want to guarantee that you can uh, provide strong worst case guarantees. And you know, in the context of routers, the kind of throughput guarantee you're typically trying to achieve is what's called work conservation. Right. And that just means that you, you, know, you never have a link that's idle if there's some packet going to that link. So the, I'm assuming that the switches, I mean, you, there's some sort of pooling mechanism that watches what the queue depth is and then and yep. sends it back to a centralized collector. How do you ensure? We actually do it in a distributed way, but oh, okay. the, same, the same thing applies. How, how do you get those information or the, those data back in case the fabric is experiencing congestion? Or are you just relying on the, the speed up to eliminate uh, congestion on the back side? Yeah, so, you know, we're... Um, this is actually sure. a problem that happens, for example, to us. Sure. Is that sometimes the state information we want to send, unrelated to us, gets choked right. off by already congested network. Yeah, so. right. Right, and so, yeah, I don't have a separate answer for that. You know, you could obviously, I mean, what we do is we engineer things so that the amount of state uh, that we're distributing is a small fraction of the overall state being sent through the network. So it's maybe, you know, a few percent of the network traffic is associated with these distributed state updates. Um, now, if you wanted, you know, to, to make, uh, give yourself sort of strong guarantees with respect to that, uh, you would probably want to assign that to a high performance or a high priority traffic class so that you could have a high you know, assurance that those packets would get through even when there is congestion uh, in other traffic. Thank you. Yep. So you, you mentioned per packet load balancing. Yep. Um, and, the, and of course the potential for out of order packet delivery. Have you done, have you actually done anything in that regard where you've implemented per packet um, round robining across links and um, per what? Oh what, yeah. And then what's your, you know, what if any experience have you had? And I apologize for the amount of yeah, assumptions sure. that go into this. Sure. Right. Um, but have you had the fight with TCP and out of order packet uh, delivery triggering things yeah, like yeah, fast no, no, retransmit? Okay. Right, and, right. 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 No. So I mean, you can, you know, if you're managing the overall traffic flow through the network properly, the, um, the. The, you can engineer the, the probability of out-of-order packets to be smaller than the probability that the wings of your plane fall off, okay? I mean, you, you can really, you know, make this as small as you want, right? You can't make it zero, right? Okay, unless you, I mean, it, there are techniques you can use to make it zero as well, but uh, in this context with well-regulated traffic, uh, you can really get very strong probabilistic uh, guarantees that have, that are not at all dependent on traffic, okay? So that's you know important factor to understand about it. Um, is it dependent on the relative simultaneity of communicating state information across the network? Nope. No. No. It's just dependent on you know. Um, I mean there you know, there is a probabilistic limit, but it's a probabilistic limit imposed by the random choices made by the algorithm. Okay, the algorithm is making certain random choices, and that's what really um, you know. Uh, is the main source of uh, randomization or you know probabilistic characteristics here, okay, and that sort of offsets any you know negative effects of the probabilistic traffic, right? Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah.